a lovely day this is in Nashville, Tennessee, and I hope that it's a lovely day now in Florida for those poor people who have suffered through so many storms. And I just talked with someone in Florida a little bit ago, and the prognosis there was that their power would come back on in a week or maybe three weeks. One to three weeks was the prognosis. Can you imagine that? Uh, no storage for refrigeration or your freezers or anything else. You've got to rely entirely on canned goods. All the local restaurants are closed. Uh, we really are fortunate, <laughs> all the rest of us who don't live in Florida. This has been a terrible year for them. But for those of us who don't live in Florida, it's a nice day and it's a good world. And this is Harry Brown, and we're going to talk about your money today. And I'm not going to tell you some tried and true way to run your $10,000 IRA into a million dollars. I'm not going to tell you some way by which you can find the perfect stock that's going to quadruple in value over the next year. I'm not going to tell you any of that, because that sort of thing just doesn't happen in the real world. What really happens is that people like you and me take our money, we put it in a very safe environment and make sure that it grows and that it will always be there. And then if we have some extra money that we can afford to play around with, then we play around with it. And take the advice of people who say, hey, this is the hottest thing going right now. This stock has got a long way to go or gold's about to skyrocket or whatever it is. But we always do it with money we can afford to lose. In other words, for the money that is precious to us, it's got to be a secure investment for the money we can play around with. Speculation. The speculation part is just like going to Las Vegas. Uh, you go there and you say, well, i got $300. I can afford to play at the craps table, the blackjack table, the poker table, the slot machines, whatever it is. And if I lose the $300, it's not going to change my life. But I'll have some fun in the meantime, and who knows? Maybe I'll come home with $2,000 as a result of playing the $300. But whatever happens, I am not going to bet the family farm on it. All right, well, this past week I was in San Francisco at a big money show seminar there. Very nice show, very well handled, good exhibits, and so on. And I heard a few of the speakers, and of course, most all of the speakers were there to give their outlooks on what was going to happen over the next year or two or three, especially with regard to stocks. And I sat in on one general session speech by a speaker who will remain nameless, who laid out a very impressive scenario as to why the stock market is going to have one big push upward again, one more bubble, as the whole enterprise was labeled. He kept referring to the bubble over and over and over again, and when that bubble's over, what a crash we're going to have. And then other speakers who had similar views also talked about how you can figure out when that crash is coming, how you can figure out when to get out of the stock market. And as I listened to the bubble story, I thought, this sounds familiar. Oh, yes, I remember now. Back in the early 90s, I heard speakers talking like this. Oh, yes, back in the early 80s, I heard speakers talking like this. Oh, yes, back in the 70s. And it seems as though there have been as many investment analysts and advisors prophesying the enormous crash in the stock market as there have been religious fanatics prophesying the end of the world. And there are dates certain by which it's going to happen, and yet it never does. And I'm not just talking about fanatics on the outskirts of the investment world who predict these things. And it really doesn't matter whether they're predicting an enormous crash or predicting an enormous bull market. They simply have no way of knowing what's going to happen because it isn't given to human beings to predict the future. Now, 
Investment advisors can be very, very useful. An investment advisor can do a great deal for you. He can use his knowledge and experience to help you set up an investment portfolio that suits your needs. And he can show you how to carry out your plans. This is the way the bond market works. This is the, these are the ways by which you can invest in gold, and so on and so forth. He can provide a great deal of knowledge and uh, insights that you wouldn't have on your own without doing a tremendous amount of study. And I call these investment advisors the helpers. But there's a second group of investment advisors that you might call market beaters. These are the people who recommend speculations, such as I heard over and over again in this conference in San Francisco. They recommend speculations to help you obtain a greater return than the market markets are offering to just any old person who comes in and decides to invest his money. Now, of course, some of the investors, many of the investors, do both. They are helpers in that they provide information for you that's valuable, but they also are posing as market beaters. And I really think the helper is worth listening to. Uh, he or she can acquaint you with investment alternatives that you weren't aware of, uh, and alternatives that might be a good fit for your particular needs. He can teach you the mechanics and procedures for getting things done in the investment world. He can uh, raise the questions that you need to answer in order to devise a portfolio that suits your needs. And he can help you reduce the tax bill on your investment profits, whatever they may be. There are uh, people that call themselves financial planners. There are people that call themselves investment advisors or investment counselors or investment uh, consultants. There are all different labels by which they go by, but they can be very, very useful if that's what you look to them for. Now, a market beater does something else. He points to speculative opportunities that you might not otherwise see. And if he's a good one, he identifies clearly the risks involved in a speculation, and we hope that he would keep you humble by pointing to possible future events you haven't allowed for. And that's what's good about an investment conference like the one in San Francisco. Somebody could go there saying, oh, I know that inflation is coming back over the next year, and that's why I'm going to put most of my money into gold. And he gets there and he hears a speaker who lays out a very convincing scenario as to why inflation is muted and is going to stay that way for the next year or two and something else is going to happen. Now, it doesn't mean that this speaker is necessarily right, but he has pointed out the possibilities that perhaps you didn't think of when you walked in that door, that you were so sure everything had to go one way. And so it doesn't hurt to hear the forecasts of the market beaters because they help to keep you humble. They help to remind you that there are other possibilities than the ones that uh, you have been relying on and have been betting on, more importantly. But remember, no matter how smart or experienced he is, the market beater cannot predict the future in any reliable way. You can't expect him to spot the right times to buy and sell. Nobody can, because no one can know the motivations and intentions of hundreds of millions of different people, each of whom will have an effect on next month's prices, and each of whom can change his mind in unpredictable ways and not even tell you about it. We'll be back in just a minute. You can call 1-800-259-9231 if you have a question on any aspect of money. 1-800-259-9231 or email me, question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org. Brown has an E on the end. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at LibertyFree.com, 
You can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just $9.75. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Failsafe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here, and this is The Money Show. We'll be here for the rest of this hour. And if you have a question, give me a call at 1-800-259-9231. 1-800-259-9231. doesn't have to be a question. You may have a comment, may have a criticism, oh, or you may just want to collect a bill or something. Whatever it is, 1-800-259-9231, or email me, question at org. We were talking about investment advisors and their ability to help you tremendously in making investing easier by showing you how to do things that it might take you quite a while to learn on your own. But that also we should be oh, very wary of anybody who claims to be able to help you beat the market, the market beater in other words. And, of course, everybody who does have, make such a claim, and there are thousands of them, I should say really tens of thousands of them in America, comes with a fantastic track record. Wow! Look at this. We got into the stock market just before its last upturn, and then we got out just before it began to come down again, and we did this and we did that and so forth and so on. And it's easy to be impressed. And I'm not saying that these track records are necessarily less than perfectly calculated. Well, I'm not saying they're phony. Let's put it that way. But even if somebody actually did call three turns in the market, three in a row, perfectly, that doesn't mean that you can make money with them. It's easy to assume that the advisor who has such a hot recent record is the best choice because, after all, he's the one with the so-called hot hand right now. But you have to realize that his recent record, or even his long-term record, can reflect nothing more than a brief lucky streak, possibly. And if it is a lucky streak, it may be just about to end. Now, when you hear about somebody that's called five or six turns in the market, and if it seems that the claim really is true, it's hard not to believe that, well, I mean, this can't be luck. This can't be coincidence. This has to be somebody who really knows what he's doing. But the fact is that it can be luck. It can be coincidence. And, and look at it this way. Suppose that there were no investment advisors who had any ability to see the future in any way whatsoever. But there's 10,000 of them out there in the United States. Now, pure chance alone, pure statistical probabilities will tell you that out there, there's going to be a whole bunch of them who have called the last 10 turns in the market perfectly. And 10 is really a conservative number. It probably would be more like 50. Just because out of all of the different possibilities of what people have said, some of them are going to be right 10 times in a row, even if none of them knows anything about what he's doing. And I'm not saying that no investment advisor knows what he's doing. I think uh, there are a lot of very smart investment advisors out there. But it's easier to see if you take it out of the realm of investment advising. Suppose there are 128 people in a room, 128 people, and each one of them has a coin in his hand, and we ask them to flip the coin. Well, the laws of statistics, the laws of chance, tell us that most likely somewhere around 64 of the 128 are going to flip heads. 
and 64 out of the 128 will flip tails. So we ask the ones who flip tails to leave the room, leaving 64 people in the room. And we ask them to flip again, and around 32 of them flip heads, and we tell the other 32 who flip tails to leave the room. So now they're 32, and they flip, and now we're down to 16, and they flip, and now we're down to 8, and they flip, and now we're down to 4, and they flip, and now we're down to 2, and they flip, and now we're down to 1. One person. Now, what has this one person done? He has flipped heads seven times in a row. Seven times in a row. Now, if you didn't know anything about physics or anything of the sort, if you'd never gone to school and you walked in and saw that somebody could flip heads seven times in a row, you'd think this person had some special ability, some special talent, some special skill to be able to do that seven times in a row. But, of course, you'd be wrong, wouldn't you? It's the fact that there were so many to start with that it just was almost inevitable that one of them would, would flip heads seven times in a row. And if we'd kept them all in, a, in the room, uh, not sent the, the losers out of the room, then there would have been somebody there who had flipped tails seven times in a row. And neither of them would be especially good coin flippers or especially bad flippers. They would just be mechanically flipping coins. In the same way, with all the investment advisors in the world, despite the inability to predict the future of human beings, there's bound to be somebody who's going to. That's why every year some famous fortune teller who gets in the news can tell you about some prediction that he or she made last year, because out of the ten predictions made, there's bound to be one right. And if you got a whole bunch of fortune tellers together and made them make, say, five predictions for next year, uh, out of all of them, probably one of them, if you had enough to start with, one of them would get five of them right. And yet I wouldn't bet a dime on anything that fortune teller said was going to happen next year. And there's one more important factor here. You only hear of these people after they've had this lucky streak, after they have, in effect, flipped seven times in a row flipped heads seven times in a row, meaning it's only after somebody has compiled a good track record that you hear of them. You don't hear of them at the start. Nobody comes along and says, this person has not done well up to now, but he's about to start having a lucky streak, so you should bet on his advice right now. No, you won't even hear about him. Nobody will suggest him. Nobody will recommend him until he's had his lucky streak. And this is why there is actually a scientific principle that says that the investment advisor who has the perfect record up to now is going to lose his touch the moment you start acting on his advice. Now, that sounds like whimsy, but it's really true. Not perfectly true. He may have one more good uh, prediction, one more good market call or whatever after you start acting on this advice, but at some point he's about to lose it, and it's going to be soon because you wouldn't have heard of him unless he had already compiled his lucky streak and had something to be able to tout that would come to your attention. And as a result, many, many people keep chasing after one advisor after another and then say, I'm not doing well. Where am I going to get that market wizard? Oh, here's one who's been right every time up to now. I'll use him, and boom, he's no longer right every time up to now. Well, we'll pursue this a little bit further, and I'll actually offer some advice on what to do after we come back. This is Harry Brown. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. Thanks for listening, and don't go away. We have another half hour yet. This is Harry Brown. My book, Why Government Doesn't Work, provides libertarian solutions to many of today's thorny political problems. How to make America much safer from foreign attack while reducing the military budget dramatically. How to end the Social Security program and free us from that oppressive tax without leaving senior citizens holding the bag. How to reduce crime while reducing government. 
how to end the income tax immediately and cut the federal budget by over 90%, how a libertarian president could reduce government even without a libertarian Congress, why government doesn't work is now available for downloading at libertyfree.com for only $9.75. Just nine seventy-five for why government doesn't work. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it from your easy chair. You can get Why Government Doesn't Work tonight at libertyfree.com. Well, hello again. Harry Brown here, and this is The Money Show. We'll be here for the rest of this hour, and you can join the fun by calling 1-800-259-9231. 1-800-259-9231. And let us now go to the phones, and we'll talk with Paul in Virginia. Good afternoon, Paul. Hi, Mr. Brown. I have a question uh uh, what is what's your opinion on why the financial danger on the federal budget deficit isn't recognized right now? And like, there's an article on the Prudent Bear website that was published earlier this month that showed that if we were using GAAP accounting, that the federal deficit would have actually been 3.7 trillion dollars, or more than 100% of all of the wages and salaries of all of the uh, wage earners in the U.S. for 2003, fiscal 2003. Well, I haven't seen that particular estimate, but it, it does sound a little overblown, although there's no question that on two counts, the federal budget deficit is understated. Uh, the first count, which is the most direct, is that all they're doing is taking money from Social Security each year and using it to pay bills in the general fund. And the result of that is that the deficit does not seem as large as it really is. And during the late 90s, when they said they had a surplus, they actually had a deficit. And the way you could tell that was by the fact that the federal debt continued to rise every year. And if the debt is rising, obviously you're not running surpluses, you're running deficits. The second way that they do not account fully is that they are not taking into consideration future obligations. In other words, the unfunded liabilities of not just Social Security, but all of the insurance programs like the Federal Deposit Insurance, uh, the crop insurance, and uh, all of these other things that they have made promises on, promises that we will cover you in the event of emergencies and so forth and so on. And any insurance company that does not want to go to jail would have to have money covering that, and they would have to account for it in their books, both on a current year P&L basis and on their balance sheet in terms of assets and liabilities. So in those two ways, obviously, the, the budget deficit is understated, and it may be that the real deficit is a trillion or two trillion, whatever, seven trillion, for just the budget deficit for this year seems a little overblown. But in terms of what the debt is, what the liabilities of the federal government are, they are enormously larger than the about $7 trillion that the national debt is supposed to be right now. Now, you had a second question there, and that was why is it that there isn't much attention given to this. Actually, there's a great deal of attention given to it in the investment world. And this goes way back to the 1960s. Uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and in the current decade, there have always been a lot of investment advisors calling attention to the debt, calling attention to the deficits, and predicting dire consequences as a result of it. And I'm not saying that there won't be at some point dire consequences, 
but when you just walk into this and suddenly see somebody talking about the sky is falling, uh, you do have to put it in perspective and you have to realize that people have been saying the sky is about to fall for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And the, the one, unfortunate, one of the unfortunate side effects of that is that when it really does become time for the sky to fall, a lot of us aren't going to take it seriously because we've heard so many false warnings about it. It is a problem. There are, uh, I above all, of course, believe that the federal government runs its affairs terribly, that the federal budget ought to be about uh, 3% of what it is now, and we can defend this country better than we do. Uh, I believe that we ought to terminate the Social Security system and unwind it and get people to be able to take care of their own futures in a much better way than the government is. But that doesn't change the fact that we need to deal with the world as it is as far as our personal finances are concerned. Now, that's Paul, that's probably five times as much of an answer as you really wanted. <laughs> so uh, take it apart and tell me what, what you, where you want to go from there. Well, um, last, last week uh, I was listening to the archive of last week's program, and you're saying that people didn't really think that the U.S. dollar presented any financial danger as far as its status of being the preferred form of money until inflation was uh, like over the 4%, 5% level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was their perception. But, I mean, why isn't this massive borrowing of the government up up around like the total amount of all the wage earners uh, salaries for the whole year and the government's out there borrowing even more than what everybody earns for the whole year why doesn't that enter people's perceptions as a financial danger well most people are not going to investigate this to the extent that you have let alone to the extent that people who make their living in the investment world are likely to do. Uh, people around the world, even people in the United States, are going to fas fasten on one particular indicator to tell them when there's trouble brewing. And for people who hold dollars around the world, the easiest indicator is the level of inflation in the United States. Now, probably you know, certainly I know, that the consumer price index is nothing more than an educated guess. There's no way you can come up with an index that really accurately measures inflation in the U.S., uh, price inflation in the U.S., but it is a reasonable indicator in that it gives you a good idea. Obviously, if inflation is, if their rate is 10%, you know that conditions in the U.S. are not the same as when their rate is 2%. So in a broad way, it gives an indication. Now, most people in the United States probably don't even fasten on any indicator. They don't even pay any attention to it at all. But people around the world who are holding dollars and who might consider uh, switching those dollars for gold are most likely going to do it on the basis of what the inflation rate seems to be in the United States. And as long as inflation is low, they are not going to switch into gold because the dollar is the most popular form of money. But when uh, inf the inflation rate begins to rise and gets up to 5, 6, 7 percent, then some of those people start switching from dollars to gold, and that's what causes a bull market in gold. And we are not there yet, as you well know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate your call. And we will be back in just a couple of minutes. And if you want to call, it's 1 800 259 9231. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. You've worked too hard for your savings to risk them on somebody's grand plan to double them. Wouldn't you rather have a safe, secure portfolio, one that grows steadily each year without the wide swings in the investment markets? For 25 years, I've shown people how to have such a portfolio. 
one that made money the past few years rather than losing heavily. Now you can get that same help from my book, Fail Safe Investing. You can have that secure, bulletproof portfolio. You can download Fail Safe Investing at libertyfree.com for only $9.75. Then read it on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. The book can give you the security you crave without becoming a speculator or a market whiz. Go to libertyfree.com to read a sample chapter and then start protecting your savings. Failsafe investing can be yours tonight at libertyfree.com. Hello again, Harry Brown here, and we still have a couple of segments to go on the Money Show for this Sunday afternoon, this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's beautiful even in Florida, because the hurricanes are over, at least for the moment, and we hope there will be no more the rest of the year. And I'm not just being a newsman spouting platitudes. I have a lot of friends in Florida, and that's why it concerns me. I'm glad to see that at least for now, the hurricanes are over. We've been talking on the show about uh, investment advisors and their ability to provide you uh, a great deal of help through the knowledge that they have of ways to do things in the investment markets that you may not know about. And they are in a position to save you a great deal of time. But we can't expect them to get you in and out of the markets with precise and profitable timing uh, that no matter how impressive the track record, there is no way you can reliably depend upon anybody t to do that. And l lastly, let me just say, I have been in the investment world for many, many, many years. I no longer say how long it has been or when I got in there because it makes me sound older than I like to think that I am. So let's just say it's been a few decades. And because of the success that I've had, I had three best-selling books in the 1970s, books that were on the New York Times bestseller list, one that actually reached number one. Uh, because I've spoken at investment conferences, because I became famous as an advocate of gold, silver, and foreign currencies during the 70s when they were skyrocketing, and I was lucky to have had timing that I would never expect to be able to do again. And because of a lot of reasons, I have had the opportunity to meet literally hundreds of different investment advisors, including some very famous ones. I haven't met every famous one, uh, especially the ones who are particularly famous now, but I've met an awful lot of famous ones, and I have read an awful lot of books on investing, and I have received an awful lot of newsletters, and I have heard an awful lot of speeches at seminars, and I use the word awful advisedly because some of them were just plain awful. What I'm trying to get at is that if there were someone out there who really knew how to get you in and out of the markets reliably and was willing to share that information with you, sell that information to you, let you in on his secrets, if such a person existed, I would have come across him by now. But there is nobody, nobody in the world, in the United States, in the state of Tennessee, in any geographical framework that I'm familiar with, that I would give my money to and say, here, you invest it for me because I know that you can beat the market. Now, everything I've said about investment advisors applies equally to trading systems and market indicators. Everyone that you hear about, of course, has a great track record. It 
has called five turns in the market in a row. This indicator, this indicator, watch this indicator. When it passes this mark, then you know it's time to sell or it's time to buy or whatever it may be. And there are all these indicators, and they all have special good records for the same reason that we talked about with investment advisors, and that is you're not going to hear about one of these unless it has happened to call five turns in the market in a row. But again, there are thousands of trading systems, thousands of market indicators out there. Uh, At any given time, there are bound to be some that are actually working, that are calling many turns in the market in a row. But the most important thing we have to understand about this is that trading systems are based upon historical information, that this is what happened in the past. And the reason you're hearing about it is because somebody's done all this data mining, been working at his computer and trying every possibility and come up with the fact that, hey, the last five times in a row that the market went up, it was preceded by indicator X having crossed point Y in terms of numbers. And so any, all I have to do is watch indicator X, and when it crosses point Y, I'll know it's time to buy and some other indication with uh, time to sell. But the fact that it's worked the last five times in a row gives it no more than an even chance, if even that, that it will work the next time. And in fact, what we find is that investment advisors are continually saying, we update our indicators. We constantly monitor them and improve upon them. Well, why would you have to do that if they work? If it worked and it worked for a really valid reason, then it ought to work again in the future exactly as it is. The fact that you're tinkering with them and continually changing them is a tip-off that they are not reliable, that they have no ability to dependably tell you when the markets are going to turn. Well, we have one more segment, and it's got to be positive rather than negative, so when we come back, I'll tell you what I think you ought to do. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, with that happy music, we're ready to face the week ahead and know that we have control of our own lives, if not the lives of others. And if each of us just simply focuses on what he can do best, which is to improve the life of himself and his family, then there can be much better times ahead. But one of the things we have to do is to beware of false gods, if I may use a religious metaphor. But that's really what it is. It's a false hope that there's somebody that can lead you in and out of the markets, that there's some trading system that's been proven to be right. And one last point about trading systems is that they are all based on historical data. And it is important to understand that history does not flow from a Xerox machine, that history does not repeat itself in any predictable way or in any literal way. Yes, we go through cycles of war and peace. Yes, we go through cycles of prosperity and recession. But those things do not come on a timetable. They are never the same as they were before. They're never the same length. They're never the same uh, timing for entering them. They do not play out in the same way. There's an old expression that the generals are always fighting the last war or preparing for the last war rather than preparing for the new kind of war that's going to come ahead. And as a result, all kinds of mistakes are made. People get killed that shouldn't have been killed, and so forth. But it's the same thing for investors. To a certain extent, they are dealing with historical knowledge, and so they are playing the future as though it were the past. Now, what can you do? Well, recognize that 
the first thing is not to lose money. And that means don't be betting it on things that are not likely to happen, meaning that you're going to be able to have an insight into the future. So the best thing to do, in my view, is to have a balanced, diversified portfolio that will protect you from whatever comes. It does not have to be complicated. You can simply buy an S&P 500 mutual fund, uh, meaning one that tracks the index of the S&P 500 that will go up or down with the stock market. You can get it from Dreyfus or Fidelity or Schwab or Merrill Lynch. Almost any large company will have an S&P 500 index fund. Then you That way you have some of your money in stocks. I think a quarter of your money ought to be always in stocks. Even if you think the market's going down, but you don't really know when it's going to turn around, so have it all the time. A quarter should be in gold. Just to buy it from any coin dealer, from coin dealers that advertise on these Genesis shows, from somebody in the Yellow Pages. Another quarter in uh, long-term treasury bonds, which you can buy from any broker, and another quarter in a money market fund that invests only in treasury securities. We'll talk about these things more in future shows. I hope you'll be with me on those future shows. So this is Harry Brown saying, please come back next week. That's right. Come back, and I'll see you then. Come back. Mm -hmm. Come back, sweet papa.